Hello everyone, I'm Victoria and I'm coming to you today with a huge update in the disappearance of Heather Kelly. Really quick, I want to apologize if my lighting or sound is a little off in this video and probably the next one I film in my new apartment. I just moved as you can see by all of the boxes that I have yet to unpack. I do have a set area that I'm going to set up to film in. I have some new things that I think are really going to improve the quality of my audio and once that gets set up it'll just be the place where I film all the time. Um, but this was the best solution I could do without, you know, having to take up, take down and set up lights constantly um, for the next couple of weeks while I'm still unpacking. But you may hear some background noise, like I can hear the cat water fountain and I'm now very worried that it's going to be really loud on video. Um, and my cats have been scratching on the scratcher the whole time I've been trying to record this intro. So I apologize if you hear any of that and thank you for your patience as I am getting settled in my new apartment. And before we go any further, I want to give you just a quick warning about this video. This video will include graphic descriptions of crime scenes and possible murderous acts. There will also be discussion of domestic violence. If any of that feels like something you can't listen to right now, please click off the video and I hope to see you in another. Heather Kelly of Kalamazoo, Michigan went missing on December 10th, 2022 after going to pick up her boyfriend from work. She told her eight children she would be home shortly, but she never did make it home. And horrifyingly, it would become very apparent the foul play was involved in her disappearance as her car was found the very next day burning with blood on the front and back seats. And pretty early on, investigators determined that Though they hadn't found her body, Heather had been a victim of murder. It has now been over a year since Heather was last seen on December 10th, 2022. And just days ago, on January 10th, 2024, the main suspect in the case and Heather's boyfriend, Carlos Watch Jr., was charged with the open murder of Heather Kelly. It's been around a year since I originally covered Heather's case on my channel, so I do want to go in depth and recover all of the details of her disappearance, especially because with these new charges, there have actually been a lot of new details revealed through the court documents that are linked to this open murder charge. I originally was going to give like a skip here to find the update but if you just wanted a quick update that was pretty much it feel free to click out of the video but if you do want to hear the new details and what led to investigators charging carlos watch jr with heather's murder then stick around because we're going to get into all of it at about 9 p.m on the night of december 10th 2022 Heather Kelly gathered her phone, keys, purse, and everything she would need to be gone for just a few hours. She said goodbye to her children and assured them that she wouldn't be gone long. And I just know if Heather had known that something, or rather someone, would keep her from coming back to her kids that night, she never would have left. She would have put everything down and gone to the couch and sat down with them or gone to lay in bed with them. She would have held them close and stayed home safely. That way she would be with her children still today. Like most of us though, Heather couldn't see her future and she couldn't see that that very night, her life would be cut short. Heather left that night and got into her truck to drive into downtown Kalamazoo and pick up her boyfriend, the then 37 year old Carlos Watch Jr. from his place of work. Along her route, Heather stopped at a Speedway gas station in Comstock, Michigan, before proceeding to the park club in Kalamazoo, where Carlos worked as a busboy. Heather's car was seen on surveillance footage, pulling up to the park club and sitting in the parking lot around 10.30 p.m. And it seems that she and Carlos had been on the phone together or had been having some sort of phone interaction for over an hour up to this point. Carlos clocked out of work at about 10.30 p.m., and according to co-workers, he did so pretty aggressively. After that, a man appearing to be Carlos is seen on surveillance footage getting into Heather's truck. Around the same time, a message was sent from Heather's phone to one of her children saying that she would be home shortly. But Heather wouldn't be home in a little bit. Sadly, she would never return home. And what would happen over the next eight and a half hours 
would be pieced together through evidence, cell phone data, and witnesses who came forward after the fact. It seems that whenever Carlos came out of the park club, they actually switched seats. So Heather went over to the passenger side and Carlos got into the driver's side. After Carlos got in the car, the car is seen leaving the park club parking lot. And as they were driving, Heather's phone would be turned off near the Western Michigan University's campus. Carlos's phone would be turned off shortly thereafter. And while Carlos's phone would turn back on about eight and a half hours later, Heather's would never turn back on again. Carlos was also wearing an electronic tether as part of his federal parole. I've read a few different things depending on the source, but it seems that around 9.30 p.m. that night, Carlos's tether either died or was tampered with so that it was turned off. Those GPS trackers and monitors do have to be charged, I think, in a wall outlet. Like, I think they have to be plugged in um, to an outlet to actually charge. So I know it is possible that they die, um, but it's unclear if this was done so intentionally, if he let it die because he thought something was going to happen, or if he tampered with it because he was going to do something, or if it just died because he had a long shift, maybe he forgot to charge it. All of those seem pretty possible at this point. And I do just want to make a comment that I have to wonder about this. If anybody knows, please feel free to comment. Um, I would appreciate it, actually. Is there not something that, like, goes off at the parole office or, like, in their system that someone's tether has died after a certain length of time or, like, has been turned off? Because I understand they wouldn't be able to track them from that point on, but you would think that you're like, oh, we can no longer track you. This is part of the terms of your parole. Like, we should, we should be looking into this. So, I don't know about that. I, I don't know. Obviously, this is a very flawed system. You know, part, little angle monitors that have to be plugged in by... The people wearing them for them to operate correctly um but who knows i i don't know enough about it to comment on it i just had questions and couldn't really find answers so if you know i'd appreciate your help in the comments thank you and part of the reason those questions even came up to begin with was because carlos's tether would not turn on again till later in the morning on december 11th so it was turned off the night of December 10th and didn't come back on till the next morning. So like at what point are you penalized or is it like lit up in the system that like, hey, this person's tether is not working. So I, that's where the question came from. If you know, I would really appreciate it. And if not, I will do some more research and hopefully let you know in like a community comment or maybe a comment on this video. Um, I'll f see what I can figure out. Now you may be wondering why Carlos was on federal probation and had to wear a tether. Um, well, allow me to fill you in. Carlos Watch Jr. Which like, total thought. Can we talk about that for a second? What is up with men with the last name Watts? What is happening? We got Chris and Chris out here running around ruining the name Chris Watts forever for everyone. And now there's Carlos Watts, which I should also add that his brother, piece of work, his brother just got arrested for some sort of child abuse crime a couple months ago. So gross. His last name is also Watts. So like, what is with these dudes out here ruining the last name Watts. I'm sure that there are perfectly lovely people out there with the last name Watts, and these men are just out here running amok and ruining things for people. We don't appreciate it. Get it together. Like, I, I totally understand that it's not just the last name. There are plenty of Smiths and other people out there. There is a major um, murderer that I can think of off the top of my head that is, like, an infamous true crime case. He has the same last name as me, so I get that it's not anything, like, specifically with the last name, but it's too hard to ignore the infamous Chris Watts and Chris Watts, um, and now we have Carlos Watts and his brother out there being a scumbag, too. 
I don't appreciate it. And I'm very sorry that these men are ruining your last name if your last name is Watts. That was a total tangent. I'll get back on track now, but that just popped in my head. And I was wondering why the name Carlos Watts kept setting off. Like, what does that mean? Like, why does that sound familiar? That's why. So, thank you for listening to my rant. Let's get back to the details of the story. Carlos Watts Jr. was convicted of federal charges related to a cocaine situation, which led to a murder-for-hire plot. He had just been released from prison and placed on parole in July of 2022. He was released into a program called the Kalamazoo Probation Enhancement Program, or KPEP, as I'll refer to it throughout the rest of the video. So he had a tether and lived in a home for others on parole as well, almost like a work release or halfway house. So that night, as the hours passed, Heather never returned home to her kids. Heather was a reliable woman. She was a good mom who loved her children. She said she was going to be home, so she would have been home that night. Which is why when she didn't come home, her family just knew something was wrong. So on the very next morning, December 11, 2022, Heather was reported missing to the Portage Public Safety Department. And the police really took her disappearance seriously from the get. And there are details that have been shared now that I think will show us late, a little bit, that I'll talk about a little bit later on why they jumped into action so quickly. But luckily they did immediately jump in and begin searching alongside her family. Later that same day, as police and Heather's family were searching for her, her cousin spotted her car off the area of South Sprinkle Road and East Michigan Avenue. Investigators found several horrifying pieces of evidence inside Heather's car. The first was a significant amount of blood covering the front and back seats of Heather's car. This blood would in fact later be confirmed to be Heather's. They would also find hair that was Heather's, small torches, and a screwdriver. There were also signs that the vehicle had been lit on fire by the small torches, though I don't believe there was significant burn damage done. I'm a bit unclear on that detail. Some of the new information that has been shared in these court documents is that as police were searching the area around Heather's truck, they made another terrifying discovery near Picard Road. In a wooded area, they found the clothes that Heather had been wearing the last time she was seen alive. On this very first day of searching for Heather, police went to go talk to Carlos at the KPEP home since he was the last one known to have seen her alive. Now, I don't know exactly what was discussed in this meeting, but what I do know is the very next day on December 12th, 2022, Carlos would go AWOL, fleeing federal custody from this home. Now, I don't know exactly what was discussed in this meeting, but I do know that on the very next day, December 12th, 2022, Carlos would go AWOL after stealing a pair of scissors and cutting off his tether and then fleeing the KPEP home through an emergency exit door. In doing so, Carlos became a wanted man for fleeing federal custody. So as police and investigators were searching for Heather, they also began searching for Carlos. After only two days of searching, Carlos was found in a home in Battle Creek, Michigan. And after a two hour standoff, he was successfully apprehended and taken into federal custody. At this point, he would be charged with federal escape charges. But his days turned into weeks and the searches for Heather progressed to include water searches and cadaver dogs, Heather still wouldn't be found. Police suspected foul play immediately, but in February of 2023, police officially declared the investigation a homicide and no longer a missing person search. Though police have not found Heather in the 13 months since her disappearance, they have amassed a mountain of evidence that points directly at the man who has been a suspect in her case since the very beginning, Carlos Watch Jr. And I mean evidence and witnesses started rolling in from the beginning. To begin with, witnesses at the KPEP home began telling investigators that whenever Carlos came in at about 2.45 a.m. on the morning of December 11th, they noticed he was covered in scratches. And Carlos even told some of these witnesses that Heather was the one to have given him those scratches. 
Through the court documents recently released, we've learned that a witness came forward in the days after Heather initially went missing to say that Carlos allegedly told them that he had hit Heather in the head with a blunt object and then disposed of her body afterwards. In another report, the witness is said to have said that Carlos told them that he actually disposed of her body in a dumpster. Which I think if he did, it could explain why Heather hasn't been found yet. It is so, so hard to search a landfill and successfully find a body within it. I think it has been done very rarely. But there's just so much in landfills that it's nearly impossible to find someone if that is where they ended up. Um, so I think that if this is what police are believing, it could explain why her body has not been found and why they are proceeding at this point with a no body homicide charge. And I have to say, everyone had something to say about Carlos and what he allegedly did on that day or what he may have told them he did. Co-workers at the park club had mentioned that when Carlos clocked out on the night of December 10th, he did so pretty aggressively. And I think that there is a chance, you know, they'd been on the phone for over an hour leading up to Heather getting there. So I'm wondering if maybe that has something to do with it. Like maybe they were a fight started while they were on the phone or they were continuing a fight from previously. And maybe that's why Carlos was already mad when he was clocking out. Um, granted from... A lot of what I hear and will talk about, he's scummy and pretty awful, so he could have just worked himself up for no reason or perceived something bad happening and been mad, um, but those are just my speculative thoughts on the situation. Other witnesses would also come forward after Heather's disappearance to tell investigators that Carlos allegedly said to them that he and Please forgive the disrespect in this statement that he made, quote, got rid of the bitch, unquote. And here, I want to dive a little bit deeper into the relationship between Heather and Carlos. As a little bit of a precursor to that, Heather and the father of her children had been together for years. Um, they'd never been married, and when they did break up. Um, it seemed to have been pretty amicable. Um, all eight of their children are theirs together. When they broke up about two years before Heather's disappearance, it seemed like Heather got majority custody of their children, but their dad was definitely still involved. He was still in their lives, and it seemed like he and Heather still cared about each other from what I can tell. Now, I don't know exactly when Heather and Carlos started dating, but I'm assuming it was sometime shortly after he was released on parole in July of 2022. In early reporting on the case, Carlos and Heather's relationship was described as on and off again, but family and friends have been able to give us so much more context to that and what's been revealed by them and in the court documents is so much worse and so much more horrifying. Allegedly, Carlos made several statements about wanting to harm or assault Heather, both to other people and sometimes directly to her. As a matter of fact, I believe there are Facebook messages of him saying things like that to her directly, like, you make me just want to hit you. Heather's stepmother shared with investigators that about two months before Heather's disappearance, she'd actually reached out to her stepmother and asked if she could stay with her that night because Carlos had allegedly threatened to slit her throat during an argument. These court documents have shared a lot of disturbing information and even messages between Carlos and Heather. Um, he had even been asking her to, kids to spy on her and to give him information about her. And he had been demanding that she set up video for him to be able to watch her while she slept. This man was obsessive and controlling, and this is not a healthy relationship at all, and it's definitely so much more disturbing and worse than on again, off again. Despite these very concerning incidents, though, 
it seems that they may have had plans to move in together. And this is not something that is unusual in domestic violence relationships. It can be really, really hard to pull back or put the brakes on things when you are in a situation where you feel like you don't have control and you are in direct like threat from your partner that they have the ability to hurt you or do something horrible to you i think that you know heather had every reason to fear physical violence from carlos And even if he never laid a hand on her before December 10th, 2022, which I am unsure of, I think she had every reason to fear physical violence. And he has now proven that he was, in fact, the person that she was afraid of. And so when we hear something like they may have been planning to move in together, keep in mind that getting out of these situations is not easy. And at times for the women and men who try to leave these relationships, they are at the most danger when they do try to leave, when they do try to end things. That is when most homicides occur in these situations. So it just breaks my heart that she was going through all of this and yet it was just so hard to put the brakes on things or slow things down because it is impos- It is really hard in those situations. I've seen it firsthand with people I love, and my heart just breaks for Heather and her family that this is how she spent her final months, and that, I'm getting ahead of myself, but that the scumbag took her from them. It is heartbreaking. And aside from all of these witnesses coming forward, the physical evidence against Carlos has stacked up as well. The clothes found not too far from Heather's truck included women's underwear, women's jeans, boots, and a do-rag. The do-rag was identified as something that Heather had been wearing earlier that night and something similar to um, something that Carlos was seen wearing. So like he was seen wearing a similar do-rag either earlier that day or in the days before. All the other clothes were confirmed to have been what Heather was in fact wearing the last night she was seen alive. And after they were able to run tests on the clothing, investigators found that both Heather and Carlos's DNA were on the jeans and the do-rag. Phone data obtained showed that Carlos's phone was turned on several hours after being initially turned off. The GPS data after the phone was turned back on reportedly shows Carlos walking away from the area where Heather's truck was found and toward the KPEP building. With all this, there is some comfort in knowing that Carlos has been in federal custody since December 14, 2022 on escape charges. Initially, Carlos tried to tell investigators that he didn't flee because he had done anything wrong. He didn't think he was being considered a suspect in Heather's disappearance, but rather he fled because Heather's brother, who was being referred to as TK in a lot of the court documents, was allegedly sending him threatening text messages, such as saying he was going to cause him harm and pictures of an assault rifle. Um, And so Carlos was saying that he felt very threatened and fled custody, which... As someone with brothers and a generally overprotective family, maybe Heather's brother may have, in his grief and his panic, sent Carlos text messages that he really shouldn't have sent. While I understand the sentiment and maybe where it came from, if it did happen, because keep in mind, investigators have not confirmed if these type of text messages were sent to Carlos's phone. Like, was TK in the right if he did these? No. You're only going to make a situation worse. I don't recommend doing it. I understand why you want to do it, um, why someone may be compelled to do it in the moment, but it's going to create so much extra havoc for you and your family. It's just not going to help. Um, and I mean, I genuinely don't know what I would do in that situation, but just as advice, if you, God forbid, I hope none of you ever end up in the situation of having a sibling go missing, 
don't do it because I think it's going to cause a lot more harm than good. And even if you know that, I think it's going to cause a lot more harm than you expect it to cause. Just as a inf informative piece to everybody. But I want to talk about the logic of Carlos there for a second. So a man who your girlfriend's brother starts sending you these allegedly threatening and harassing text messages while you're in federal custody. You're in a building monitored and secured by the feds. Now, I'm not saying that the federal government is always good or even that people who are in charge of taking care of, you know, parolees and prisoners are, are always the best at watching out for them. I am not going to pretend like that doesn't become an issue. But if you're truly worried about your safety, you're probably in a pretty good place to get some sort of help in a federal, a federally run and secured parole area, right? Like, <laughs> Tell somebody, get help, like tell the police. I'm sure the police would have gone to TK and been like, my guy, cut it out. This is not helping. Um, but no, Carlos decided to cut his tether and run, which just doesn't make sense to me. Um, now, I think that to prove his point, of maybe feeling threatened. I think it was more for nefarious purposes, but I could see this being an argument on his part. He did ask for a new phone number um, from KPEP on December 11th, so immediately after Heather went missing. So maybe he was getting threatening texts from TK, but he doesn't... For, it's my understanding that he doesn't tell anybody that, like, I need a new phone number because I'm being threatened. Doesn't bring up the threatening text messages, just wants a new phone number. And so, in my opinion, it was more like he was asking for a new phone number to help him flee. Just in that moment. But I could be wrong. Um, but I do. I did want to mention the request for a new phone number because I think he's going to try to make that argument of, like... Well, I did ask for a new phone number because I was being threatened. Like, that's the proof. But, like I said, investigators haven't even confirmed that text messages like this exist. And, as a matter of fact, there is a um, quote from the federal prosecuting attorney that I want to read you because it is so funny. I don't know why I think it's so funny, but... I actually, I do know why I'll explain it after, but I need you to hear this. Hours before his escape, defendant was involved in the murder and disappearance of TK's sister. Defendant's escape from KPEP was not done to avoid a harm from TK, but to avoid the ensuing police investigation. Defendant was escaping criminal liability for murder, not avoiding perceived threats against him from his victim's brother. And I think that is just the best professional legally way of saying like shut up you weren't threatened you were trying to escape murder charges like sit down and be quiet nobody believes you and whether carlos felt he was being threatened in his mind or in reality who knows at this point because we're not getting a lot of confirmation on it that he did end up pleading guilty later on to his federal escape charges which, in my opinion, is just a real smart thing to do because I have failed to mention that the whole escape is caught on camera. He is seen, like, leaning over the front desk like there's a partition and he leans over and, and grabs a pair of scissors and then cuts his tether off, gathers up all his stuff that he has with him, and flees out an emergency exit. Like, it's all on camera. And so, you know, pleading guilty was a pretty good idea. And he was just finally sentenced to 14 months of incarceration, according to the U.S. Department of Justice.
So now that this sentencing occurred, this federal sentencing for the escape charges occurred, they will begin transferring him over to state custody to face the open murder charges in Kalamazoo, Michigan. I find open murder to be a pretty interesting charge and one that I think will work well in this situation. Rather than having to charge him with first or second degree murder, um, basically prosecutors will have to go, will get to go in and just present the facts as they know them, as they have found, and allow the jury to determine if this was intentional and plotted out and therefore first degree murder. Um, or if it was more heat of the moment, like rage overtook you and you killed somebody, which would be second degree murder. So like no planning and motivation, the little cat paw, um, but no planning and motivation happening there. Um, premeditation was definitely the word I was looking for. Sorry about that. So the prosecution won't have to push on one or the other, rather the jury can determine it based on the facts. So now Carlos does in fact face the possibility of life without parole if he is convicted of first degree murder, which I think there is a chance that he could be. Um, I do personally think premeditation went into this, even if it was minor premeditation. Um, so based on the limited legal classes that I took in high school, which was way longer ago than I ever think it was, if there is time, for you to think about what you're doing and plan it out and like make several steps at a certain point it becomes premeditation it is no longer spur of the moment heat of the moment self-defense anything like that if you have to go through step after step after step after step it's intentional now like you have gone through the premeditation you figured out what you need to do like you've made the choice at this point. Um, so I think the fact that he turned his, her phone off, he turned his phone off, those are premeditated steps to hide what was about to happen, in my opinion. Um, I also think that if he let his tether die during his shift on purpose or tampered with it, that shows an even further premeditation of like, before she ever got there, that he was going to do something that night. Um, obviously, we don't know now if that is what happened. Um, and even if he did intentionally let it die, I think it's going to be hard to prove that without some sort of confession or evidence showing that he did. Um, but I think it's a possibility. It's something that could definitely prove that he thought, I mean, he thought this through. And it feels very intentional the f even if he just turned their phones off at some point it became premeditated like you felt the moment and you turned the phones off and then drove and caused her harm and killed her there was plenty of time in there to stop it or seek help so it would be stopped so at that point it becomes premeditation um so i think there's a lot here that's going to point to first degree murder in my personal opinion and though they haven't found Heather's body, the Kalamazoo prosecutor has said that they feel confident moving forward with these open murder charges. Kalamazoo prosecuting attorney Jed Getting is quoted as saying, Police have searched multiple locations during the course of the investigation, as well as that area and other areas. We have not recovered Heather's remains. We would not be moving forward unless we had sufficient evidence to prove Mr. Watts guilty without reasonable doubt. And I think that's what's going to get Carlos here, is the totality of the evidence pointing to him. I think that there are pieces of evidence that individually they could be explained away, but at a certain point, when everything is pointing at you, when everything all together is pointing at you, a circumstantial case can be just as compelling and just as convincing as something with a lot of physical evidence or being caught on video footage or something else because I mean just everything else everything all together points directly at Carlos I think the biggest thing that the defense will probably try to explain away is the DNA on Heather's pants and on that do-rag that was found 
Um, so both Carlos and Heather's DNA were on those pieces of clothing. Um, and I think that, you know, it wouldn't be a bad argument to say, you know, Heather was his girlfriend. Carlos and Heather were in the car together that night. And so it is not unusual for his DNA to be on her clothing. Um, now, granted, if it is, like, blood DNA, which it very well could be, because it seems like Heather may have scratched the crap out of him, um, based on the fact that witnesses actually saw the scratches. It seems like she may have gotten him real good, um, which I surely hope she did. Um, so maybe it is blood DNA that's on these pieces of clothing, and if it is, I don't think they'll be able to explain that away at all. Um, but if it's other, some other form of DNA, like hair or touch DNA or other DNA, I think that that may be harder to be like, well, why else would it be there? Well, it would be there because they're, they're dating. They were together in the car. Um, so it's not unusual for his DNA to be on her. And I think this will come up with the do-rag, too, that, um, you know, it seems that Carlos had been wearing it at some point. So I think the argument could be made, like, yeah, both their DNA is in it because they were both wearing it. So it's going to depend on what kind of DNA it is. Um, but at the same time, <laughs> Carlos and his genius, um, instead of making that argument in statements... Um, his argument is that the police planted evidence against him, that they planted his DNA on her pants and do rag, which like, my argument makes sense. Do you really think the entire Kalamazoo police squad is like, against you, which, don't get me wrong, there are cases where police do this, but this is not one, they don't have, like, this major history together, there's not, I, th why would they do that? So, that is his argument, which is just mind-blowing and baffling to me. And another argument Carlos is making in his defense is another police-planted evidence type argument. Um, where he's saying that they tampered with the timestamp on their surveillance footage showing him getting into Heather's car with her that night. I have to say, I don't quite understand the purpose of this argument. I'm reported to be on footage matches with the rest of the timeline and with what other people have said. So maybe the timestamp on the actual video is wrong because any clock set by a human could be inaccurate. My kitchen stove clock is six minutes fast. Um, drives me insane. I think I'm running behind all the time. Um, but I have yet to be bothered or disturbed enough by it to fix it. Um, so it's just wrong. So I'm wondering if maybe like that's the situation. Like Maybe it wasn't set forward or it wasn't set back right. And so based on the totality of everything they looked at, they were able to correct the timestamp. I don't understand the purpose of this argument because say the timestamp is different. There's so much other context around when he got into her car that kind of invalidates the need for a timestamp. Um, I mean he they're on the phone together leading up to it heather's phone is in the parking lot um he clocks out and then his phone goes into the parking lot and then their phones are together until they're turned off it's an irrelevant argument in my opinion even if there is proven to be some sort of changing of the timestamp, which i think if there is it is to correct the problem um, I mean, I know a lot of cameras, people just don't set the times right, or they don't set them back and forth with daylight saving time, all sorts of stuff like that. So maybe um, that's what's happening. I don't know. But I wanted to bring it up. I don't think it's going to be an issue, but it is 
it's weird why he thinks that the police have such a vendetta against him whenever he's, he, he, there's plenty of evidence without this stuff. There's still plenty of stuff pointing to him, so. At this point, it is pretty early in the process of Carlos being charged with open murder. I'm sure more information co will come out, and I think there will be a trial. I have to say I'm really hoping that he will plead guilty and spare her family the pain of a trial, um, but I, I don't know that he's going to do that because he is very much denying that he had anything to do with her murder or disappearance. Um, not only is he, you know, making these claims that police are tampering with evidence or planting evidence um, and stating very clearly that he had nothing to do with it, um, but he's even been in contact with some news stations um, specifically saying that he is not involved in her murder. News station Target 8 even published a quote from one of these emails, and I'll read it to you now. I want Heather's eight children to know 1,000% that I had nothing to do with their mother's disappearance. You have clearly been given half and false truth information. So that seems to be his stance at this point, that he had nothing to do with it and he is not guilty. Um, we'll see how things proceed. Hopefully, I'm hoping that there will be some sort of deal worked out where if he reveals the location of her body, you know, he'll get some time taken off a sentence um, if he pleads guilty. I don't think that will happen, but I, I wish it would so that Heather could be brought home to her family. And I want to end this video by doing two things. I want to focus on Heather and who she was for a bit, and then I want to tell you how you can still help. Start this by sharing with you a video clip from Target 8 of her mother and Heather's cousin talking about Heather and what she was like at a candlelight vigil that was held for her this year on December 10th, 2023, a year after she went missing. Heather Kelly's loved ones gathered tonight to honor her as they continue to seek justice. News 8's Byron Tollison was there. This is the spot where Heather Kelly's car was found, but one year later now, the mother of eight remains missing. <laughs> You're just a good girl. <laughs> she loved her kids. <laughs> I just want her back home. One year since Heather Kelly's disappearance, her family says they still have no answers, no justice. It's been hard. Can't call her, can't go over there, see her. Kelly had eight kids between six and 18 years old. They're doing the best they can. It, it's hard. They're, some don't even understand at this point what's really happening. Heather's cousin remembers her as a ray of sunshine. Everything. She was the light of the room. When she came in it, it lit up. Her loved ones honoring her Sunday a year since her disappearance. A moment of silence. Gathering with candles. Two, one. Love you, Heather. And releasing balloons into the sky. They met on East Michigan Avenue, north of Sprinkle Road, where her car was found abandoned. According to court records, police found her blood on the front and back seats, and the driver's seat was partially burnt with trace evidence of gasoline. Police believe Kelly was killed, but her remains have still not been found. I mean, at this point, we've been begging for a year for somebody to come forward. This wasn't done and nobody knows about it. There's somebody out here that knows something. And if you do, just please let it be known. I can just feel the love from her family in these clips that I've seen. In the few clips I've seen of all of them talking about her, you can just feel how much they love her and how much they miss her. She seemed like a beautiful woman and a wonderful mother. She deserved to live a long, beautiful life filled with her kids and her family and all of the wonderful people she would have met along the way. And in my opinion, she didn't get that chance because her life was sh cut short by an evil man 13 months ago. She should be with her kids and her mom and her brother and her cousin and 
everyone. She should still be here today. She deserves to still be here with us today. But sadly, she isn't. And there is still something you can do to help her and help her family. Authorities are still investigating what happened to Heather. And so if you know anything about what happened to Heather, her disappearance, where her body may be, Carlos's movements in the on the day she was murdered and in the time around there where she may have ended up anything any little piece of information you have about this could be everything police need to either convict Carlos or find Heather if you know anything please please reach out to police Heather was only 35 years old when she went missing and her life was cut short she deserved to live a full, happy life, and at the very least, she now deserves to be brought home and to see justice. So just in case it will help, I do want to quickly describe Heather's appearance and body type to you, um, just in case it helps jog any memories or for various other reasons. Heather Kelly was a 35-year-old woman who was about five foot eight and approximately 125 pounds. She had long blonde hair and brown eyes. She also had various tattoos. In some of the pictures I've seen, she was wearing glasses, though I haven't seen it mentioned if she was wearing them the night she was last seen. Do you have any information about Heather's disappearance, where her body may be, or what Carlos may have done that day or in the days after? you are asked to call the Silent Observer. You can call the Silent Observer at 269-343-2100. You can also report this information to the Silent Observer online, and I've linked the website down below in my um, description section. So you can find that link below if you have any information to share. I also want to note that the Silent Observer is still offering a $5,000 reward for any information that can help locate Heather's body and bring her home. Thank you so much for watching. Stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye!